Good. Hi everybody, um, my name is Peter Jones, I'm a consultant that works uh, around the world with teachers and ministers and an awful lot for the British Council and uh, you find us here in the British Embassy in Budapest uh, and I've been given uh, some questions to talk to you about uh, so if you just give me a second I'll remind myself what they are um, about how do we see the future of education in the 22nd century uh, that's, a big, that's a big question if I had more time we could look at it together I think for me the main bits that I want to talk about is that it will be open children and learners will purchase their learning when they want it, where they want it. Eight-year-olds will flick through YouTube and work out which they want to watch because they apply their values and their knowledge and they will go to YouTube to learn what they want to learn, when they want to learn it. So I think education will be open. I don't think it will take place in buildings called schools and I don't think it will take place between the hours of nine and three and I don't think we'll have eight weeks off in the summer. Imagine if Google closed down for eight weeks while everybody at Google went to cut down crops. It's a bonkers notion, and it won't sustain. I think that education in the 22nd century will not be knowledge-based. There will be some knowledge attached to it, but it will be mainly skills-based. Obviously, you can't teach skills without knowledge, but the focus will be on teaching children how to learn. Uh, uh, metacognition, I suppose, is a technical phrase, but how we can help children learn what they need to learn, when they need to learn it, and love learning it to love learning and to embrace learning in the widest possible sense. So it's not short-term memory, but it's actually learning to comprehend plurality and learning how to comprehend difference, difference of opinion, difference in time and place. Because as, this, as we gloriously become a global village through internet communications, the kids across the world have got smartphones. If only we would let them use them, they can talk to anybody, anytime, about anything. So I think that education for the future really has to help kids understand how to deal with that plurality and that complication and that confusion so that they love it and they're not frightened by that plurality. But if you're frightened by plurality, fundamentalism becomes attractive. If you're confused, anybody offering you a simple solution becomes very attractive. And in a complex world, simple solutions ultimately, it seems to me, become dogmatic and they could become self-protecting and that doesn't seem to be the way to embrace the future. So very quickly that was my thoughts there. How could teachers understand the importance of teaching values? <clears throat> if, if there's great complexity and we're having to keep making choices, we make those choices based upon our value system, but we don't know we have those values until we meet somebody else with different values because we think they're odd. So the great beauty, I think, is to engage teachers in questions. If every, teacher in the, if every parent in the world, when their children came home, said to their child, what was the best question you asked today, we'd have a really exciting education system in the world, instead of saying, what did you learn today? Because it's asking questions which opens up the brain to learning. If you put up your hand to give an answer, you're reiterating what you already know. So you're compounding ignorance. Asking questions is saying, I'm open. Google works because we have a question. It doesn't ask us to answer the question, it asks us to explore. Wikipedia is, is about exploring our truth. So if we're going to teach children values, I think we do that through greater questioning. We ask children, why do you think that? How do you think you know that? If that's true, why do other people think this? What, would a different, what could a different answer be? What use would a different answer be? So I think teaching will move much more to a coaching pedagogy than an imparting pedagogy. And it's through question, and that's taking us back to the sophist and Greek roots of formal education. If you think about the word education, it comes from the Latin word educare, which means to lead out. In this complex world, we can lead out of children what sense they make of that complexity and how that's the sense that they make depends upon the values that they hold and how we can challenge those values because by the simple use of a smartphone we can get those kids conversing with kids all around the world. So the notion of group work will in the next two or three years I think transform dramatically and as soon as we say to kids go to group work they will get out their phones and they will talk with other learners of any age all around the world and in discussing the differences they will be able to eke out what the values are and then able to talk about the values at a much deeper level. So if you think about people that you meet at a 
when you first meet them, you find them attractive, but actually what makes the relationship is shared or interesting values. So international work around the world will move from merely what do you wear, what do you cook, what's your journey to school, those superficial things, and we'll be able to get right down to the values about what makes you and what makes me. So I think questioning is the route to do that one. Uh, how can teachers find time and energy to get re-energised? Okay, uh, we say in English, if you want a job done, give it to a busy person. A busy person creates energy. There's a thing called um, teleology, which is without a goal or die, we die, and that we create the energy to achieve the goals we set. So if you think about when you get to the end of the, holiday, the, end of the term, people get ill. When you get very old, you die, then sometimes your wife or husband dies because their reason for living has gone. So without a goal, we die. So you get energy by resetting a goal. So if you have a goal, you then create the energy to achieve that goal. So sometimes as a teacher, I can be really tired by the end of the school day, but other days, I've got a busy school day, then I've got to go shopping, then I've got to go to a meeting, then I've got to go to my children's school, then I've got to go and visit my mother, then I've got to plan for tomorrow, then I've got to do my ironing to wear clothes, and I have the energy to do all those things. So if I give myself a big goal, I create big energy, and if I give myself a small goal, I create small energy. So we need to get inside teachers' heads through conversation and questioning and challenge and say to them, what would be a really big dream? Because with a really big dream comes really big energy. And I think that's true of children as well, that many children have had their dreams taken away from them because school ends up letting them know what they can't do. And if they can't do it, their dreams go. And if their dreams go, their energy goes, and then they're very hard to teach. So we need to get inside children's heads about their dreams, saying, how are you going to achieve your dream? So if they've got their dream and they want to achieve it, they will be hungry for anything that will help them achieve their dream. So it's about flipping that around a bit. And my fourth question is, what are the challenges and pressures for teachers of English? OK, I think the biggest pressure on teachers of English is, not to, is to guard against English being the new colonization of the world. And I think we have a real job on our hands to maintain the respect and the love and the affection and the modernity of indigenous languages. Because otherwise we will only have one language. And I, I like the English language, it serves me very well. But there are lots of concepts, phrases, feelings, emotions and understandings which don't exist in English. And if we only have one language, then we lose all that understanding and all that knowledge. And the great thing about the internet and social media is, is that through a common language, if English is going to become that, we have a meeting place where we can then take people to our own languages which, and our own understandings, which are only communicable through our own languages. One only needs to read a novel in French to realize that French people think and emote differently to English people. So how do we as English teachers maintain a joy and a love and a respect of home languages? I think the second challenge for English teachers is to, is to look merely beyond the fashion of, to, of speaking English, but to help children understand the derivatives, the nature, the, the formula that sits beneath languages around syntax and understanding. Because if I understand the purpose and the value of communication, there'll be times when English is an appropriate medium, but there'll be times when other languages are the people, whether that's sign language, whether that's emotional language, whether that's physical language or body language. And I think as we move into the 22nd century, with technology that will be able to communicate at different levels, it seems to me, though I'm here to be proven wrong, that emoting and the communication through physical and non-verbal languages is still one of the things that we as homo sapiens can do that those machines can't do yet, and that might be our USP as people. So how do we as English teachers regard English as a fashion? It's a very useful fashion accessory. A lot of the world runs on English. It is a meeting point, but you only come to English in order to realize its limitations and explore the other things that sit outside English. And in that way, we will get a balance between all languages and what all languages can contribute to our shared understanding of this world and using that knowledge to help us thrive in the next world. Is that okay?
I'm done. Oh, okay, there you go. All right.